Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Let's see. Good afternoon. It's um it's a pleasure to see all of you. Sorry, we're not live, but it's it's good to think that you are that you all are out there and are watching us. We are it's a pleasure to see all of you. Sorry, we're not live, but it's, it's good to think that you are that you all are out there and are watching us. We are it's a pleasure to see all of you. Sorry, we're not live, but it's good to think that you are all out there I would like to uh, introduce now our, 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 our moderator for the program. Before that, I would like to say that this is this is a the beginning of our 17th year of presenting the speaker series. This is the first of, of three. Uh, we present in June, July, and August. Uh, this month is on young adult ministry. <clears throat> in the following months, uh, July will be on the Bible. And then in August, we will uh, cover uh, the liturgy. We're hoping that this helps you if you are looking at starting a young adult ministry uh, and, and being able to put together something that will fit for your needs. We also, um, for those of you who have a young adult ministry, that you might learn something today that um, uh, learn something today that will help you improve or enhance your ministry. So at this time, I would like to introduce uh, David James Cofield, uh, better known as DJ. Uh, David is a student at San Santa Monica College. Uh, he's in the STEM program. Uh, he's um, uh, his, his his professional invitation is that he would one day be able to become um, a computer uh, science, computer engineering, computer science um, in that field, in the computer science field. Um, he's also involved in uh, a number of activities on campus. He's in the, they have done of clubs there and DJ is part of that, that structure of clubs and, and representing one of the groups there. And I'm not sure exactly which one. Um, and, and for full disclosure, DJ has been involved with the African American Catholic Center uh, most of his entire life. Uh, and the reason for that, he's my grandson. Uh, and so he's, He's here, he's still involved. He's our webmaster, he handles our web page. And um, DJ is, a, I, I consider him a very deep thinker and he's always involved in, in the programs that we do. So it's really my pleasure and, 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 and it's such an honor uh, to have DJ at this level of, of our ministry. So DJ is your moderator and I'm gonna turn it over to you. He's probably gonna start with a prayer and then we'll go ahead into our, our program. Hello, thank you for introducing me. Um, again, my name is DJ. I will start off with the prayer. Um, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, DJ. Et Eternal God, you are our rock. You are the firm foundation for everything we build. You give gifts to your people for the good of the church. You equip and you train your people to carry out the good works you have prepared for us in advance. As we meet today, please ask that you would provide wisdom, guidance, and direction. Remind us that you are our loving ally, you are our fortress, you are our tower of strength, and you are our rescuer. Everything we need is found in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Um, to, start out with our, to start out with our presentation today, I will be having a conversation with Candace Montgomery. Candace attended St. Mary's Academy in Inglewood earned a Bachelor of Business Administration degree from the University of, Nor of Notre Dame and an MBA from Mount St. Mary's College. Her home and school education has fostered a spirit of faith and service. 
Candice was the 2018 keynote speaker for her high school and the MC at the 2023 African American Catholic Center for Evangelization's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Prayer Breakfast. Thank you, DJ. Good morning. Good morning. And to start off with my conversation with Candace, I will have I will start with one of two questions. The first question that I have for you, Candace, is what major challenges did you face or continue to face as a young adult minister? Um, well, I I would say, you know, first you have to see what the need is. Um, and so being able, if you see there's a need and you know that you have a gift or a talent, um, sometimes the challenge can be, how can I get that gift or talent out there? How can I serve? Um, for me, um, when I first got involved with the lector ministry, it was a, uh, a matter of trying to understand, you know, the, the history of the parish or the culture of the parish. Um, and as I, that, but getting involved in that ministry helped me to get involved in um, other volunteer work with the parish, which eventually led me to become um, parish council president. And so I think, um, Th that is uh, one challenge is trying to understand, you know, the background. Um, there's always going to be things that are established before you uh, get there. I would also say uh, building relationships and vulnerability based trust is um, is a challenge, but that's really important to be effective. And then the final uh, challenge, I would say that um, you can face when you're uh, starting out as a young adult minister is uh, where's the worst power located? Power can be centralized or power can be dispersed uh, throughout the parish. So uh, that might be another obstacle uh, to overcome. So basically just trying to like involve yourself with, with, within the environment and being able to learn your talents. Yes, and know how to offer them. Overcome. Mm -hmm. So my second question to add on that is who or what helped you in becoming a young adult minister? So who or what helped you be able to navigate those environments and to be able to learn your talents so you could do what you So my second question to add on that is who or what helped you in becoming a young adult minister? So who or what helped So uh, who helped me actually? So Father Alan Roberts and Miss Marsha Hilt when I was first getting involved in the lector ministries. Uh, I, again, I saw that I had, I had something to offer. I had a gift to offer. And so I went to Father Al and I told him, you know, it was actually my sister and I, we, we told him that we would like to be lectors. And, you know, we had a series of meetings uh, with him, you, you know, had to explain why did, I, why did we want to get involved? We had to receive training. And that's where uh, Miss Marsha came in too, because at the time she was in charge of the lector ministry. And we went through and received our preparation. Uh, so I would say those those two individuals were extremely um, influential, uh, and essentially because you know otherwise they could have been a roadblock if they had if they had said no, right? But they said yes, and they helped to form us. Um, I guess beyond that, um, now that I'm more involved in the parish. I would say the the entire parish community, the support you receive from uh, the clergy and the leadership of the parish, but also all the other parish volunteers, because that's what makes uh, a community successful. So again, going back to relationship building, um, there's so many people in the parish that serve and dedicate their time. So being able to work with everyone to, to come together for events or for ministries, um, I'm deeply thankful uh, to those individuals who've, who've played that important role in my development. So basically just all those within, within the church who would be mostly dealing with were the ones that really shaped how you became into young adult ministry. Yes, and it all started with, with the lector uh, ministry. And then it's funny, once, once you help in one area, then you might get shoulder tapped and somebody wants you to help in this area or they'll invite you to do different things. So I think also a person's willingness um, to say yes to opportunities. So it kind of goes both ways is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to have an openness uh, to it. 
Well, thank you. Uh, as well as my questions, uh, Candice also has has a presentation of her own survey that that she uh, did previously before this. Thank you, DJ. So please allow me a moment to share. Okay. Uh, to prepare for today, um, I conducted a, a small survey. I got about um, about 20 or 19 uh, responses, but um, I, I called it Exploring Perspectives on Catholic uh, Church Attendance. So I'll be going through those uh, survey results. So um, I just did this survey to prepare for the panel and I used Google Forms to create the survey and then I distributed the link via Instagram, Facebook, email and text message. So I'd like to thank uh, all those who completed that survey. And for those of you who are watching, Ideas and thoughts may come up during my presentation. You may want to take notes, so feel free to take out um, a piece of paper just in case you want to jot down one of your ideas. The next two speakers will propose solutions. I will identify some of the uh, problems revealed through my survey. My primary goal was to understand why people, in particular, my peers have stopped attending Catholic Church for Mass. And now I would like to just go over some of the demographic data I collected before we get into the actual survey questions. So the first question, what is your current faith or spiritual practice? Um, as we can see, most of the respondents identify as Catholic, 5% uh, identify as Buddhist, um, 5% identify or 10% identify as agnostic, and then 15% identify as other. And the other was um, spiritual or not really practicing religion at this time. What was the faith practice of your childhood? Um, as you can see, 95% identified with Catholicism, 5% identified it was uh, other, but there was no response given for that other. What is your sexual orientation? 85% identify as heterosexual, 5% as gay or lesbian, 5% preferred not to say, and the 5% that was other did not um, provide a response. What is your gender identity? 45% identify as male and 55% identify as female. And now I'd like to get into a little bit of the um, demographics by generation. So um, there are four generations represented on this survey. I didn't uh, receive any responses from baby boomers or gen alpha, um, which is uh, not surprising because my target audience was my peers and I am a millennial. So my goal was to uh, reach millennials and um, some gen Zers and I was successful that 70% of respondents are millennials and the millennials are aged 27 through 42. The next largest uh, generation to respond to the survey are Gen Xers who are aged 43 through 58. And then we have 5% of respondents are Gen Z who are aged 11 through 26 and then matures who are aged 78 through 95. So the first question was, was it your choice to be Catholic? And as we can see, 75% um, uh, say no, 25% say yes. Um, and I'm just going to assume based on the next que question, you'll see that everyone is a cradle Catholic, uh, meaning that they were uh, essentially their families were practicing Catholicism and they were baptized into the faith. Um, pretty young. And I say that because the next question, um, you can see that 100% of respondents were baptized. So I assume those that say yes, um, they chose to be Catholic or those who got confirmed. So this question is exploring what level of sacraments have you received in the, in the Catholic church? 100% are baptized. And you can see the numbers slowly taper off as the sacrament levels um, go up. Almost 79% received their, their reconciliation, 90% their first Holy Communion, and then 70% confirmation, almost 16 anointing of the sick, 21% marriage, and then we actually have 
um, one respondent that was ordained. And so getting into uh, some of the survey responses and about attitudes, my one of my questions, what are the reasons for your decreased church attendance? Uh, popular responses include uh, time, uh, skepticism of practices and beliefs. Um, uh, you know, many, you know, people also mentioned, um, you know, the church's stance on abortion or gay rights. Uh, some people mentioned institutionalized racism or sexism. Um, others had mentioned being let down by someone um, in their parish. Uh, some others uh, also mentioned dull churches. Um, uh, as, as I guess it's not as engaging, it could be from either uh, a homily standpoint or perhaps a music standpoint. Um, other reasons included having a non-practicing or non-Catholic spouse. And some um, respondents haven't found a church home. And so again, um, I mentioned some of these responses may spark ideas or thoughts, and um, I encourage you to uh, write those down. Um, another question, how often do you engage in prayer? So. Um, Although not everyone's attending church regularly, um, you can see that more than half of the respondents pray every day. 5% um, pray a few times a week, 10% uh, once a week, and then 25% uh, um, rarely or never pray. If you are no longer practicing, can you envision yourself returning to church or revisiting aspects of your former faith? So there's good news here. We see 35% say yes, definitely, and 30% are maybe, um, they're open to it. 15% um, do not see themselves returning and 20% um, do not believe this applies. What obstacles prevent you from attending mass? Uh, the popular responses include uh, time and managing a busy schedule, um, lack of motivation. And um, another response that I found interesting um, included this person said they had no one to go with, no one to hold them accountable. And have you had any negative experiences in the church? Um, as we can see, Majority of people, 63% said no, but almost 37% said yes. So some of the responses on the negative experiences include uh, the priest went on an anti-gay speech during the homily, constant fear being perpetrated, being made to feel sinful or that others who um, don't fit a certain mold. One person told a story about um, an aunt who died during the depression era and was denied a Catholic service because her grandmother didn't have the money to pay for it. Uh, so there's some oral history going on in, in the family, which has you know, been a negative experience. Another person said they have found the church to be too exclusive at times, not being able to share communion with non-Catholic um, family members um, is a barrier. They also mentioned the church's stance on um, homosexuality, um, others mentioned uh, judgmental church members or corruption in the church. And um, again, trying to change a pastor, trying to change someone's uh, sexual orientation. Were there any specific life events or circumstances that influenced your decision to stop attending uh, Catholic church? Um, some, many respondents said nothing specific. Um, others mentioned a non-practicing uh, household members or significant life events such as um, maybe the death of a loved one. Some other interesting responses um, I saw in, uh, included uh, uh, the someone said the the mass is not inviting to young people. Um, they want to hear a more relevant homily. Um, one person said uh, staring at white um, images. Um, led to them to stop attending church. And then when asked, how do you currently fulfill your spiritual or religious needs, if at all, 
many respondents uh, listed prayer, multiple respondents um, mentioned watching mass on YouTube. So praise God uh, for that avenue of our media. And another um, respondent said doing what makes them happy, which included going for walks or hiking and um, being thankful to God. And are there any particular changes or improvements you would like to see within the Catholic Church to encourage you to return to regular attendance? Many mentioned, again, um, some of the, the popular uh, things in our time right now, abortion and gay rights, the role of women in the church. One person in particular mentioned women ordination. Um, the sex abuse scandals came up a few times um, and just the need to acknowledge and heal from this past. Were, are there any positive experiences or memories from your time attending Catholic school that still hold significance for you. Many respondents reported the sense of community, the quality time they experienced with their family and just the traditions uh, such as Christmas or Easter mass. And with that, I'd like to leave you with a verse, be joyful in your hope, be patient in times of affliction and persevere in prayer. And I'd uh, like to thank you for those who are present today and a special thank you again for all those who completed the survey. Um, and yeah, so I'll be around for the comments after I'm looking forward to the next presenters. Thank you, DJ. Thank you, Candice. Um, One thing before, before we move on to y Yolanda, I wanted to say um, one thank you for that survey. Also, I noticed especially that there was, a, um, there was no existence of a lack of faith there, there was an existence of problems within the institution. And um, I especially related to that. One, as somebody who has grown up in the church, I have um, been in proximity to, to family members and, and family friends who, who held power within the church. So I never really experienced many bad experiences. But I had noticed as I got older that there were, that there were people around me who had experienced problems. And I did not experience those problems just because of my identity not because those problems didn't exist. As well, I noticed that um, currently I am part of uh, Gen Z. I'm part of Generation Z, which is mm -hmm. late 90s to um, around early 2010s-ish. Yolanda will give the exact dates on this. Um, and I noticed that- 1997 to 2012. Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. We're watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so um, I noticed especially that there's like a resurgence in terms of faith and spirituality and religion. And that I find that there is a wanting to go to church or wanting to involve themselves within religious activities, the issue is there are problems that they have faced within the institution, especially religious trauma, and not necessarily simply the existence of religious trauma, but the lack of people around them to actually try to fix things. And so, and even though the church is slow, we need to start somewhere. And it's not, it's, it's, it's the using excuses to not start somewhere that causes an issue. Great observations, um, and I do think what you're pointing out: people want to return to the to the faith or um, some practice, and perhaps it's just a gentle invitation, and per, perhaps and um, it might just be some promotion or education of the tools that are available to them because um, people are listening, uh, and there are small ways that we can change. So I um, I think we. There's more good. There is a lot of good news in this survey, um, depending on your perspective. Um, there's a lot of good news, like you said. Um, a lot of your peers are looking for that. They're searching, and as we can see, even though this survey that I conducted was relatively small, but we can see that the foundations of the faith are still there. Uh, so I think that is uh, great news and cause to be, uh, you know, celebrate. Now it's just inviting people. Um, back. Yes, absolutely. Thank you again for, for, for your presentation and your survey. Next, we're going to move on to Dr. Yolanda Brown. Dr. Brown pursued a master's degree in theology at Loyola Marymount University and a doctorate in ministry at the Catholic University of America. She was assigned to Blessed Sacrament Parish in Hollywood as parish life director with pastoral ministries, administration, and staff management responsibilities. Uh, Dr. Y Yolanda Brown will be speaking from a very um, from from more of a, a pastor's perspective and has her own presentation as well. Thank you, DJ uh, and Candice. Uh, your dialogue was quite inspirational. 
And I would like to congratulate uh, Candice uh, with her professional survey, um, albeit qualitative, it does confirm uh, some major studies that uh, I will uh, just touch on. And I'll also, uh, with the intent to develop a backdrop uh, and environment of the context of our young adults and how they function, I'm going to pepper that with some anecdotes, uh, particularly in addressing uh, some of what we just heard that was so enlightening. So specifically, uh, we'll begin with a um, young adult ministry purpose and vision, um, as well as definitely we have to know our community, as you heard earlier as the parish life director with uh, the pastoral responsibilities, knowing our community and who are they is very important. Um, I'll also take a look at intentional recruitment and retention, i.e. where are they? Where is this community, especially of young adults, uh, as we identify and invite population segments? And then touch on sensitive leadership that is inclusive of passing the baton. And of course, celebration and recognition of our young adults. So if we can begin uh, with a vision statement, which actually um, is an overall purpose of any ministry, but it is equally as important for young adult ministry. And that statement is a vision that we are connecting young adults with the loving Jesus Christ and bringing them closer to God in order to become who God created them to be. In order to become what God created them and who God created them to be. Now, you heard DJ mention that I uh, served at a um, Jesuit sponsored parish and the Society of Jesus has four universal apostolic preferences, which are guideposts. One is to bring people closer, closer to God, through prayerful spiritual exercises that includes reflection, meditation, leading to a contemplative life of action on behalf of others. Also through accompanying youth and young adults and walking with the poor, as well as caring for our environment. Pope Francis issued Laudato Si, care of our earth and our environment. So as a parish leader, essentially as important and critical, even beyond just developing a, a pastoral plan, it is how do we become a more welcoming and inclusive, loving community. I'd like to show if we possibly can who they are, and it's a chart entitled Pew Research Grouping Labels. And the focus of this chart is not necessarily just looking at the ages within these labels, but more importantly, understanding the behaviors, their attitudes, and their actions that can encourage us to become more of an inviting church as well as shaping our ministries and forming a church of the future. The first uh, three categories, uh, particularly the silent generation, which was up to World War II, um, and the post-World War II, of which I'm a participant in the baby boomers uh, segment, used to be the largest uh, segment. Uh, Pop among our population. However, as many are now moving on to their eternal life, it's shrinking. But these two generations, the silent generation and baby boomers, really reflect the church parishioners that used to, as we called it, pray, pay, and obey. 
we were re represented the traditional church. And then the Gen X is now one of the smaller populations as boomers had fewer births. But our focus on the millennials, millennials now represent at least 55% of our working population. And by 2030, it's projected that they will occupy three quarters of our working population. Millennials typically do not live with their parents. Uh, they have their own households, um, but their behavior, attitudes, and actions really can help form the church as they are forming society. And then Gen Z, which by the way, DJ, you could easily be moved into the millennial category because we're not just focusing on age ranges, but uh, those characteristics are very similar uh, to millennials. And then of course, Gen Alpha are mainly now infants uh, and encompassing our children ministries. So thank you for that chart. Now, St. Mary's Press and CARA, which is the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate in Georgetown, uh, have demonstrated statistics that are specifically on millennials leaving the church, and it's really alarming. And it's universal across all faith practices that millennials are leaving their practices, their faith practices. And according to John Vitek, uh, who is the CEO of St. Mary's Press, if we have any, any hope of changing this trend, we must first seek to better understand them. And I'll quote him that the reasons most adults think that, that young people leave the church are not the reasons that we are simply inaccurate, says Vitek. In a study entitled Going, Going, Gone, which is a deep qualitative study on young people's disaffiliation with the church conducted by St. Mary's Press and CR and CARA, it does confirm that the reasons for leaving are identical to what Candace has indicated in her qualitative research. But they're as varied as their own human experience and often quite surprising. This is across the mainstream. I found it interesting in Candace's um, survey in response to her question, if millennials would, with young adults would consider returning to church, that there were 15% who said no. And there was an additional 20% that responded in a, which could mean that it did not apply to them or there was no response. But that's 35% of our young adults that are mysteriously searching somehow. As a matter of fact, 74% actually have identified with Catholicism and about the median age of 13 have left. This is a retention issue, but it's also retention opportunity because if you recognize this median age of 13, 14, those that do serve and ministry at our church understand that that's typically post-confirmation and the opportunities are engaging our young adults as Eucharistic ministers, as lectors, junior catechists, certainly in social services. Um, those that actually do participate at Blessed Sacrament in Hollywood, we have a 501c3 that's a center that serves homelessness. And many will come and serve that center and social justice. Although they believe in something bigger, at least it's within those that have become disaffiliated and some even indicated that perhaps this someone bigger is God. They do desire community. They're attracted to social justice actions and works as we heard through Candace's qualitative research. This enables us to welcome back, to welcome and to personally invite 
before throwing our young adults into ministry to enhance their spiritual formation so that first they see that God loved us first and they can see that through us, those in that welcoming community. I'd like to share some golden wisdom by uh, Parish Catalyst, which is an organization that brings together learning communities, typically uh, pastors uh, and parish um, leadership. We were brought together with a cohort of nine of us and it did commit to three years in developing not just pastoral plans, but developing action plans and understanding inclusive of young adults. And there were four important young adult uh, characteristics, especially among the millennials, that include mistrust of institutions, that encompasses government, corporate, sports and religious institutions. Secondly, non-committal, many of them are transient. Um, I have to share with you that uh, this morning at 1217, my husband and I celebrated the delivery of our 24th grandchild. The parents are millennials. The mother, my dear daughter-in-law is 41 years old. But at this point, their commitment um, is not only to God and family and to one another and to marriage, but also to serving. When we compare that to the older generation, such as I, when we made those commitments in our mid twenties and thirties, we're finding that there is an older uh, population of, or the older level of um, the young millennials that we may find are more attractive to coming back. Young millennials, they have a global perspective. Many of them even have friends that they contact and communicate with regularly that actually live uh, in other countries. They, were, they have a more informed view of America and a greater appreciation of other countries and their own people. And there's this new order of power. They don't need our permission. They are taking over the world now. And this is not just a stereotype. It's a reality. Regardless of our opinion about millennials, they are not only the future, they are our present. Many of them now actually lead Fortune 500 corporations. Some are even pastoring parishes and holding political offices. And this is not the end, it's just a beginning with far less concern about titles and profits and traditions, but more interest in relationships, purpose and authenticity. That definitely is a shift in the areas of power and influence. So one thing we can understand is that they do not wait for our approval or our permission to make these things happen. So next, just a word about intentional recruitment and retention, uh, identifying and understanding that there are even segments among the young adult population, Catholics versus non-Catholics. It helps us to also recognize where they are located. There is a uh, alpha program for returning Catholics or aspiring Catholics or non-Catholics that really appreciate or that are aspiring to learn more about what is this deep burning in their hearts that they're calling spirituality. It's called Alpha. It's similar to Theology on Tap, and it's accompanied with videos, scenarios, and discussion groups uh, for curious minds. It's usually done off church grounds. Uh, we actually uh, were able to participate in a group on Alpha, uh, at a restaurant, uh, there was a private room at a local pub, and there was continuation and commitment. We found that there were underground Catholic devotions among young adults, right there in Hollywood down the street from the parish at the Catholic Film Studio, where they engage in liturgy, rosary, and blessed sacrament, adoration. So we went and we go and we would pray and worship with them. Social engagement absolutely requires presence of our priests and staff. 
collaboration with outside ministries, such as Christus Ministries. We had a club called Java Jazz and Jesus Club, the JJJ Club. And sports, whether or not spectator or participation. And of course, during COVID, we experienced what we call the great outdoors. Marriage and young families, they also seek um, uh, some type of community and inclusion. Uh, we collaborated with other parishes that may have had different um, communities, but we sought and we included their young adult ministers, uh, St. Monica's minister, uh, youth, uh, young adult minister was involved as well as uh, the downtown LA uh, cathedral ministry uh, with what they refer to as marriage dating. So there's also, I'd like to just mention, there's a third of millennials that identify themselves as the so-called nuns, N-O-N-E-S. They don't just affiliate themselves with any particular faith religion, but there is a group called nuns who are uh, women professed vows, religious women, uh, nuns for nuns, and they invite them in their homes. They permit them to use homes for planning uh, young adult justice actions and they accompany them. So what's really critical is sensitive leadership, passing that baton. Um, I think we're aware of the synodality listening process that Pope Francis instituted that's engaging many of us in listening and dialogue just as we're doing now. So listening deeply to our young adults as we began this session is so important. Showing them how we love before we thrust them into ministries and services so that they see that God loved us first. Providing them with young adult leadership roles, as you heard Candace is not only a member of the parish council, but she is actually the uh, president of her parish's parish council. Engaging them in uh, all different types of liturgy and planning their own adoration and prayer services, preaching and leading the parish and renewal programs. We really, as seniors, and particularly those that in long-term ministers can take young adults under the, our wings and turn over the reins, trusting that our church has a magnificent future of love and inclusivity that obviously will affect society. So thank you. Thank you, Lolanda, for that wonderful presentation. Very informative, and I just appreciate all the research that had gone into that. You're welcome, DJ. And uh, now to move on. Um, thank you again for that presentation. Uh, next, we're going to move on to Dallas Alejandro. Dallas has been involved in young adult ministry for over 40 years, serving locally at the UCLA Newman Center, St. Martin of Tours Church, and as the first full-time young adult minister at St. Monica Catholic Community. Dallas excels in creating programming for young adults and empowering young adult leaders. Dallas is going to be speaking from an administrative position. As it was previously said, she has actually administered programs and has actually participated within ad ad administrating young adult ministry. And please welcome Dallas and her presentation. Hello, everyone. Hello, DJ. Thank you. Um, well, you know, um, as you heard, I've been involved in working with young adults or being about young adults for a few decades now. And I thought that as I gave this presentation, I would share at the same time, maybe some of the first steps I took or others took with me, um, because a lot of young adult ministry is doing it with other people one way or the other. Um, it's important, especially in the early stages. But I think a lot of my thrust is going to be sharing with you some of the things we did, as well as what are maybe good strategies in trying to have young adults be more integrated into your parish communities. Um, I want to say, and I want to say this, especially after hearing Yolanda's um, words, which were just wonderful, Yolanda, thank you. Um, 
you know, like anything good in the church, young adult ministry, if you're going to do it, if you're going to actually reach out to young adults, you have to make a plan. It has to be intentional. It actually has to happen. And what I mean by that has to be part of the agenda of the parish, even if it's for a specific time period. A lot of times ministries such as young adult ministry, even youth ministry sometimes are like an afterthought instead of an actual, we're going to sit around a table maybe and talk about, or around a Zoom room and talk about what, how can we get young adults involved to make it an intentional ministry. Um, I, I say that also because that's kind of how I first started here at St. Monica. I I think I must have been, I had been involved somehow with some of the programming at St. Monica. I, I lived in Santa Monica at the time, but I kind of was going to different churches at the time as well. But one day I got an actual call from someone who invited me to help plan. There was some kind of social event at the parish and I went and did it. But um, later I found out that she was actually part of a team whose job was to look for First of all, to actually look for young adults who could potentially be part of a core team, the first leadership team, let's say, for young adults at St. Monica. And I say that because many of you hearing might even think, oh, my God, we have no young people here. There's no you don't see anything. There's no set group. There's no set time. How do we how do we find people? And I actually got found. And it was probably somebody was talking over coffee with someone and said, oh, let's invite Dallas to come. And I was actually part of a team. And actually, one of the strategies I share with people, share with communities as they're trying to think about instituting a young adult ministry, is don't get forlorn that uh, you don't know any young adults, that there's no young adults out there. Especially in Los Angeles, there are young adults everywhere. So <laughs> the thing is how to get to them. And maybe the first team you have is actually the search team or the recruiting team. There may be different names for that team, but they're not the actual team. I eventually became part of the first young adult team. And then I must have been involved here about a year and a half when at that time I was looking to do something different in my life. And lo and behold, the pastor at that time came in and said, would you consider working? At that time, it was part time in, in setting up a young adult ministry. So that's kind of how it started here. And I just want to share that so sometimes the first thing, it, 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 that you make it intentional, that it's something you want to see in your parish community, and you actually get people around a table to start planning. Because I heard that too, kind of in the first two presentations, the fact that we got to do something. Um, if you want to get young adults included, you actually have to reach out. You got to do something. Um, what Some of the things I'm going to share, some of the points I'm going to share with you Anderson can mail out when he mails out the AACFEC information when he sends out all his emails. Um, but it comes from a 10 point plan from the young adult pastoral plan that was made at a national level in the mid 90s. And some of these, there's three or four that I'm going to go over with you that I think are still important. And especially when you're looking at trying to integrate young adults, they're still very valid and some of the first steps to take. Um, one is to look at how do you improve involvement, participation, and integration of young adults in your parish. So let's say you've got a team, what could be for some of the first things that team does? Well, first of all, they look around the parish and, and maybe take an inventory, take an assessment. Where do young adults actually show up? And even at St. Monica, where we had a small team where, when I was here, um, it wasn't huge. It, it wasn't the kind of numbers that we have now. In those days, I think we were happy if we had a dozen people show up at a social. And I remember thinking, how would I do this? And I talked to a friend of mine, Father John Cusick in Chicago, who for many people in young adult ministry, they consider him like the god of young adult ministry. But um, he he's also the person who created Theology on Tap, which now is under the Renew program, but he created that program. And one of the things he told me is what he did when he started Theology on Tap, which is you got to go where the young adults are, especially if you don't see them right at church. 
But he said, but if you go into your local community, they'll tell you where those young people are. Now, this is way before. So we're talking 35 years ago. So this is way before anything, way before live stream, Zoom, social media, any of that stuff. In those days, we actually had to go look for people. And some of the places he told me to go were to the coffee houses to put up little signs and notes. He told me to go to bars, which I did, to go to beauty salons, to go to all the places where maybe young adults show up. And weirdly, and he was right. As I started stuff here at St. Monica, yes, we had our kind of bulletin advertising, which was pretty weak in those days. I think it was a one sheet thing. Um, didn't have much on it. Um, so where I was getting people walking into events was from other places. And maybe they went to the beauty salon and then they went home or maybe they, their mother told them, hey, you should go see what's happening at St. Monica. A lot of it was word of mouth. So I share that also because people think you need to have all this advertising and stuff. You know, in the early days for us, it was just word of mouth and trying to locate young adults where they actually were. Think about where they hang out. And that includes places like bars and such. That is where they're handing out. And it was kind of interesting because many of the things that Candace shared about in her survey were the kind of things I heard when I went around talking to people where, you know, some, a beauty salon operator would tell me, oh, they don't like going to the church because they think it's boring. I mean, they, because they hear, you know, these are the people who hear what people are thinking out there. So, so one is to kind of assess what's going on, not just at your parish, but to look around locally and what do they talk about? What do they say about the parish? Then to look at, based on some of that, the next step would be to begin looking at how do you improve involvement? And some of these um, um, pieces I'm gonna share with you right now are the goal with this is to tempt folks to connect with your place to actually kind of tease them into saying, into your parish community. Um, well, listen, this is a big one and I know we could have a whole workshop on it, but it is nice, like if you have a voice in your parish council or such, or with your pastor, young people do like liturgies that are engaging and that have some kind of modern tempo to the music, okay? Um, like right now, a lot of our young people, no matter what ethnic group they are, a lot of them are listening to things like Hillsong, um, praise and worship is very good. Somehow that has to be incorporated. But anything that is different than what it was is good. I'm just going to put that out there. A key thing is also looking at the sacramental life at your parish. A lot of parishes will tell me no young adults come here. And then I say, are you marrying people? Yes. Well, look, you do have young adults coming there. What are those programs like? What is it like for a young person to get married at your parish? You know, when I first came to St. Monica, big issue here was people felt the whole process of getting married was complicated and you had to be registered and you had, you know, all these things you had to have had been giving money every month or your family had you had to live within the boundaries or whatever it was and you know I have a pastor who kind of let go of all that right there's I don't think we have Audrey knows more Audrey Shaw probably knows more than I do I don't think we have any of that anymore because those are the kind of things that do that do stand as a barrier they seem to young people like a hurdle you have to jump through and, you know, it just puts a different taste in their mouth about what, what church can be. Um, and as I said earlier, it's important that it's okay that you have different kinds of folks, older folks helping to set up stuff for young adults, but that should not be the long-term team. Eventually, the team that actually leads the young adult activities, the actual people who do stuff, need to be young adult themselves. I'm a staff person that works with a team of young adults. Everyone comes to the table equally. I have eight different committees, two to three people leading those committees. They're the face and voice of young adult ministry. I'm the staff person behind it. And I mentioned this about coming to the table equally. Very important. I heard some of this in Candace's talking, especially with young women. They need to know that they have, that there's some place 
within the church community that they know that they could have some kind of an equal say. Some, you know, oftentimes young women will talk about going to parishes where from the get go, they feel they're put in a, a secondary position. They try to volunteer for something and they feel that they're, um, I don't know, like they don't have the same eligibility as, as the young men do. A common thing here is young women say that the priests don't remember their names, but remembers the guys' names. And I know sometimes you think, ah, that's in their imagination, but maybe not. I think a lot of people feel sensitive, especially at because the, they're wanting to be, if we're saying church is home then they want to feel like they're at home. And I know that when I went to the Newman Center as a college student, what struck me was how within a few weeks, one of the priests, two of the priests knew my name. They knew who I was. That was, that was really different for me because prior to that all, and I was definitely a cradle Catholic. I mean, I went to churches where I think the priest, they may have known me as my father's daughter, but they didn't really know me they didn't call me by my name and that's important um sacramental life you know i know sometimes like even here at saint monica's they'll say young adults should go through that whole rcia program i am not putting down rcia it's a wonderful gift of the catholic church but it's important that we kind of plug in people into the right spots and i'll tell you a lot of young adults who come to saint monica's even now a lot of them have had baptism and they've had communion, but they've not had confirmation. And so I remember when Sister Catherine was here, particularly, and then Suzette, they they were our faith formation coordinators. We got more involved with that regional young adult, well, the regional confirmation programs. I know you probably all know some of you more about that than I do. Oh my gosh, the number of young adults that went to that. And there was one year that 21 of them were young adult people from St. Monica. So I'm just saying, you know, here was a whole sacrament that we were not somehow making known to young adults. I don't know. I, I can't tell you exactly why. It, you know, confirmation is always an interesting thing. It's, you know, it's not like baptism and communion where there's usually a party associated with it or something like that. Um, but for many of those young adults, going to that confirmation process was a way of suddenly becoming involved in the faith community that they had never thought they would. So, uh, you know, again, your the goal here is to try to improve involvement, participation, and integration. And some of the ideas I'm giving you are not just, you know, go create a young adult group. It's looking at what you have now and where can you involve young adults? Volunteering is key. The key thing about volunteering is getting out the ways people can volunteer and remembering the lives of young people. Most of our young people, even those who work at home, cannot volunteer between two and three on a Tuesday afternoon because they're working. So you got to think of volunteer opportunities where young people can come in in the evenings and especially on the weekends, really important. Um, and you know, something I wanna to add to that because I heard some of this, Yolanda talked about this in the sense of justice and service. You know, a lot of our young people really, they have been raised in a culture, hopefully. I mean, we get a lot of really great young adults I know here at United St. Monica's who want to be involved. They want to serve others. And it's not just young adults who, you know, went to Catholic school when they were younger. Somehow that is just something really key to them. And um, a funny thing I found out as time went on is that as many young adults who want to socially meet people, like if they signed a form and they would sign what their interests are, what I would find out is that as many who signed up to want to be involved in social activities, also wanted to be involved in service and justice activities, which I argue. So the best activities sometimes is to have those activities where in fellowship, they go with friends to an activity where they're serving others in need. And I know that sounds, I know that sounds too simple, but it's true. And I have 
I just have evidence from all the years here. Because again, I think it's not just, you know, they do, they want to meet others. They want to meet others who would be their friends, who might be their best friends. I mean, gosh, they might actually meet somebody who they might actually want to have a special relationship with and marry. Um, but they also want to serve others and they want to do volunteer work and connect with others in an important way. And the best, and then the best thing is to be able to do all of that with people who have similar values and ideas such as yourself. So just to put again, again, you're trying to come up with ways and ideas. So when you look at your service activities and ways that people can volunteer at your parish, bear in mind, young people like to go with other young people. They also like to go with other people as well. They don't wanna just go by themselves. Um, but they also look at their time, look at the timing. They can't always do a whole day, but they might be able to do a couple hours. And even when it comes to donation, and that's important here at St. Monica, we do some things, especially at Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know, we have some big hitters who can give a lot of money or adopt a whole family, but it's important sometimes that people just have the ability to either just go volunteer or to donate a Barbie doll, okay? They don't have to do the whole thing. And so just bear that in mind when working with young people and setting up ways to involve them. When I get together the team for young adults, the number one thing we learn all year and work on is what we call the complete cycle of hospitality. And you've already heard some of this from both Yolanda and Candace. You know, young people nowadays, they have so many other ways to communicate and, and get information. You just, you got to be kind of ready at the very beginning. If you send out an email or you say at the bulletin, go look in the bulletin, it has to be there, the information, and it has to be correct. And there has to be a way that they can contact someone to get details. Um, that is being hospitable. It's not just getting people to be involved, but it's giving people the dignity of being able to look up something, find out the info, and that somebody is there going to be welcoming them. In young adult ministry here, we actually have a separate, in our team, we actually have a separate team that does the welcoming for the, young, the welcome team. And they help me that when young adults inquire about young adult ministry, I mean, I can send a note as a staff person saying welcome and my senior can send a note saying welcome, but it's a whole different thing when someone their own age texts them. <laughs> and says, hey, young adults, we're going to go here to this bar to have some drinks. Do you want to come join us? So um, that's why we have that other team, because again, they need to be the face and the voice of the ministry. It can't just be myself, a staff, or, or Monsignor. Um, one of the things we do that I learned, because I did this with a women's group many, many years ago, it, you know how in groups you have um, the membership dinner or cocktail party? So we have what we call a new member dinner for young adults. And it's wonder, I mean, it, it is so simple. You know, they just call, they call or text or whatever way they use, they contact young adults to come to a new member dinner. And honestly, most young adults do not know how to cook well, but it, it doesn't matter. They could either order it in they can make Costco lasagna. Now and then we actually have a chef in the group. But the key thing is that you invite young people to come to a dinner where they get to, the dinner is free. They hear a little information about the ministry. They meet other people. Um, I mean, it's an extra step, but it's an important step. And again, the young adults are kind of leading that event. But it's a way, especially here in Los Angeles, young people show up and you know, there's so many other ways. We've heard it already that they can get connected to things. This is a way to get them connected to the parish. And I have to tell you, so eventually so much, so many of our leadership will remind, will say at some event or something that I got first welcomed or invited to this new welcome dinner. And again, they are so simple, right? It could just be pizza and wine. The point is that you actually set up an event that you invited someone to, and they got to meet other people. That's the key part. And that's what we need 
by the complete cycle of hospitality. It's not just putting out the info. It's being there at the meeting, welcoming them at the door, but it's also reaching out, trying not to let people drop out. Uh, what do you call that? So many times people fall out of the systems that we have. And that's one of the reasons why we have a, a separate a separate little team that actually welcomes people and then invites them to a dinner just to try to, you know, again, connect them with what the community could be like for them. Um, another key strategy is offering new activities, organizations, and programs. So, you know, of course, you have to be at a particular level at your parish to do this. But again, if you want to have young adults, it's not at this point, it's not just about being welcomed, but actually putting them in the fabric of your parish and reminding them about where they can be part of that community is to actually give them the opportunity if they can, if you can create a team to actually set up activities for young adults. Um, and, you know, why is that important? And not that you have to do something every week or every month, but now and then, like for instance, having a speaker that comes in that actually asks question, answers the questions young adults have. Folks in their 20s and 30s, we, we heard a lot of this from Yolanda's presentation. Well, also from Candace's. You know, they, they have particular concerns about what's out there in the world and how to approach it. Um, I know sometimes I, I just talked to a sister the other day and you know, she was doing a special Eucharistic adoration for young adults, which is beautiful, but she wasn't getting big numbers. And I was, and not that you have to have big numbers, but I think she was kind of surprised. And I think my main suggestion to her was, well, maybe for the next go round, start off with something social where people meet each other and then go into Eucharistic adoration. Again, looking at the lives of young adults and what, what some of their own personal goals are, what is it that you can do or offer in a new program or a new activity that is particularly engaging for someone in their 20s and 30s and kind of teases them to come in and be more involved? And you know, some, it doesn't have to be a full on huge program, no. Um, one thing I invite pastors or leadership to think about in setting up young adult ministries is maybe you look at a particular time of year, maybe it's Lent. And maybe in Lent, you do two or three special activities or programs, or I don't know what you want to call it, that are just for folks in their 20s and 30s. And just see who shows up. I mean, um, sometimes that's even better because people will go and they go set up activities they, they think are the best or what might actually attract someone. And then later you find out, no, nope, maybe that really wasn't so. The thing is to start with young adults and ask them what they think might be, what they would like to attend. And then the last big thing I want to share is that sometimes people ask, why is it important that young adults have maybe a separate leadership group or a separate team or a separate ministry at a parish level? Because, you know, young adults need their space. They need to be connected with a greater community, but they also need to have their particular space. We at St. Monica, we do over many years now have day or weekend retreat experiences for young adults um, and just for young adults. Again, a lot of it is because they just need a space maybe with people of their same age, same concerns, you know, who are working like them um, and have maybe similar concerns. They just want to be connected with those folks. And they're looking at issues going into the future and what they might be wanting to do with their lives. And they need a safe place. And so, yeah, there are reasons why to have separate activities for young adults. Um, I was gonna just end with, um, again, looking at the young adult life and, and what's important, what, how they run their lives, how their lives are to bear in mind that some of your first attempts and strategies might be the best way then to connect with them. Um, and to know that one of the reasons it is good to have a team is to help you kind of keep the vision of what it is you start you wanted to do in the first place and involving young adults at your parish. What were the things, why did you want them there? 
um, it's real important, especially with, you know, a group that is a little different, that they feel they have um, the support of the pastor, um, the support of the parish council or whoever created them um, to be able to go forward and be that um, that leadership for young adults, that group that outreaches to young adults that they can be. So I think I'll stop there. Those are my first thoughts. Thank you so much for that, Dallas. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate your use of personal experiences and how you and how you and others have within your life have actually worked to try to expand to to make it more open for younger for younger people. Thank you. And I just I just really enjoyed your 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 your, your presentation. And again, that personal aspect really added on to it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. And now that we are done with your presentation, we can go into the Q&A. Um, before I get into the general questions, I have a few questions for Yolanda and Dallas. I'm going to uh, start with Yolanda. Um, these questions are kind of an extension of both of your presentations, but they're looking for more personal um, experiences that you've had. So to start off with Yolanda, I wanted to ask, in what ways did you help prepare and mold younger people into becoming future young adult ministers? Because as I said previously, you come from a very pastor background. And I was wondering, how have you worked to try to get younger people and to prepare them to go into young adult ministry? Thank you, DJ. You know, uh, my passion uh, for understanding and knowing community refers to the fact that everything that we're doing is relationship development, especially developing relationships that will bring us closer to God. I inherited that somewhat uh, more than 10 years ago when, um, before I even assumed the official responsibilities as parish life director, uh, the former pastor uh, who I was shadowing also was a believer in relationship uh, building. And um, so, he encouraged me during those months that I was shadowing him to conduct 100 one-on-ones. Uh, and for those who are community activists, they recognize that that's the beginning really of developing relationships, but it also needs to be done continuously uh, throughout, even if it's with your, you know, your pastoral team or, or your uh, young adult ministry team. But within the 100 one-on-ones, when, um, when I was shadowing him, it encompassed not just the parish leaders and board members, uh, the school, the, um, the uh, 501c3, the center you know, that works with homelessness, but also community leaders and government leaders and all those who help to shape community. And so it did involve some young adults. Uh, and during those one-on-ones, I asked three basic questions. One was, what do you desire the parish to continue? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, what is your dream for the parish? And then third, how do you envision helping to make this happen? I will always re uh, recall this young fellow who was a youth minister at the time, his name's Pedro. And his response, to that last question of how do you envision to make this happen? He softly banged his fist on my desk and he said, this is my parish. It is my responsibility to myself, to my family, to my community and to my church. And he has become, he eventually became our young adult minister for many years, for at least the 10 years I was there. And he was the most accessible, most available, most creative young adult leader uh, that I was blessed with. So I'll always appreciate Pedro also because he was a role model for inclusivity and community development and renewal of the church. You know, I do need to interject also in helping to make dreams become a reality in the collaboration. I, I love to add love this and that we need to 
you to be non-judgmental in journeying and accompanying young adults. So basically trying to just, 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 just expanding on what da Dallas was, was saying the entire time of, of expanding your relationships and trying to be as open as you are to, uh, to young adults because they have, they have the capacity to be to be very well involved they have the capacity to be to to be great within young adult ministry we just need we need to be able to open our doors to them uh -huh. and then my second yes. question and then my thank you again for that my second question was give me a second um oh it was what opposition have you faced in trying to prepare young adult um, ministers, I I wanted to uh, specifically not necessarily on um, issues in trying to get them involved, but what opposition have you faced amongst your peers, amongst uh, those who would who who you would look to help you prepare prepare young adults to come into ministry? Thank you, DJ. Um, actually, three uh, I guess three thoughts come to mind in terms of opposition, if you will. But I, I personally look at opposition as, as opportunities, um, particularly opportunities for improvement. Um, so in observing and accompanying young adults, particularly one-on-one -on, -one, on an ongoing basis, uh, inviting them, um, the one, I guess that one of the, um, oppositions as, as you coined them, is uh, credibility about their capabilities. Um, there's tend to be a reluctancy, but with a young adult leadership team, once you've formed them and engaged them and integrated them with uh, ministries in general, like nurse council or other uh, advisory groups, uh, they begin to also establish themselves, but we have to trust, we as the leadership, we have to trust and invite them to come to the table. I remember once, um, it was a phenomenal young lady, had beautiful gifts, um, and there was a little bit of a criticism after the first meeting that she sat there, said nothing, and she was picking at her fingernails. But she eventually became one of the, um, uh, team leaders and helping to develop uh, liturgies and ministries. So I think it does require some, um, uh, some perseverance and some trust and continuing to develop those longer term relationships. Secondly, um, I think I referred, implied about letting go of the reins. Some of us ministers believe that we never retire we'll minister until we die. And that's beautiful. And I think that, you know, God welcomes that. But sometimes we have to question why. Is it for power and prestige? Uh, our inability to maybe imagine ourselves into something greater, uh, greater service to God by maybe guiding young adults as members of Christ's body and welcoming them, lovingly welcoming them uh, and enabling them just as the former pastor who I shadow with the loving approach, recognizing that I didn't have it all together yet, but obviously someone recognized the leadership qualities and potential. Um, and I think uh, Candace referred to that too with, uh, with Father Albert and others who took them, <laughs> took her under their wings uh, and helping to guide and direct. And the third and final um, opportunity or opposition or challenge is really a uh, financial concerns. Uh, that young adults cannot sustain the church, uh, the church's capital needs, the requirements. Um, and sometimes balance that uh, when we look at the people in the pews, particularly you know the donors. I think um, Dallas referred to this that those that might be donors that might have a different agenda. We have to be genuine with uh, in ourselves as leaders and try to convey that with our. Uh, pastoral team, that uh, there is a place and we definitely um, endear all who contribute, all who contribute, and it's more than just financial. And that's, uh, I think is, is, is the, the grace 
um, a mystery of the church, how it all happens, uh, even if it's not necessarily built or based on financial um, opportunities, it does come. It really does. Um, God graces us in many, many ways. Thank you for that. I really enjoyed also that you uh, ended with um, speaking of financial stuff, my grandfather always mentions is how a lot of people within my age group up to Candace's, it's hard to get them involved with certain things because we just don't have time. And a part of that not having time is that, like for me, I'm in college. Eventually, I would be working. Other people are always working. And that financial element, especially within within our political climate and within the world's issues, is a very big, a very big problem in terms of involving ourselves and what would essentially be not necessarily a side activity because it's much more than that but an activity that would sustain us mentally and spiritually, but not financially. And um, actually I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to keep it to one question for Dallas. Uh, I feel like the other two I had kind of go in the middle of what you had said earlier. Okay. And something that I wanted to ask you was because something you guys have talked about um, that Yolanda had mentioned was giving up the reins. And um, Dallas, you have been doing this for, for, for over 40 plus years. And you've dealt with at least what up to two to generation, two to three different generations of people coming into young adult ministry. And something I wanted to ask was how how do you work within challenges of your own possible prejudices or your own possible upbringings? Because we are human, we are animals, and we carry our own. As as we as we got brought up, like my issues are not going to be the same issues for my children, my grandchildren. And how do you work? through those ideas that have been previously conditioned into you and how do you work to continue to try to keep your doors open without sacrificing yourself while also still keeping it open for other young adults? Wow. Well, you know what? I, I first think about when I was a young adult Catholic myself and I remember I'd been involved at the Newman Center and I'd been, you know, incredibly welcomed there. It was the first church, what I would say the first authentic church Catholic church experience I'd had, community experience. I wanted that for other people. Once I left that, first I had to kind of find it for myself. Once I left college as a, as a working woman out there, I had to kind of find it for myself and kind of had to go to my own parish community. I kind of went through a couple of them before I kind of settled over at St. Monica. Um, I remember what that search was like for me, how the desire to be in Catholic community was. I remember how I was rebuffed and or there wasn't a place for me or I felt out of place that I make it a point now to not want to have other people have that experience. I want people, I want young, young people, a lot of our Catholic young people are looking for what they are, a home in the church and an authentic Catholic community experience. For them, sometimes it speaks about home speaks about relationship it's it speaks about being included and so I think of ways of how people feel what's the best way to help people feel included um I came from a household where my parents were pretty shy but when we did when they did have friends and people over it was all about food and welcoming people it was, you know, you put out the best of everything you had to welcome them. I, I think it's all, those are the kind of things I grew up with that then I wanted then to transfer to other people um, through the work I do in ministry. And so some of the things I talked about, like that whole new member dinner thing came from, I worked with this women's organization that at the time it was at, through UCLA working to help Latina and African-American young women get scholarships for particular projects. The best part, I mean, it was a great organization. I love being part of it, but the best part of it was the new member dinners. I, that's the committee I was in because you were always meeting new people. And, you know, in meeting new people, you kind of year after year, you kind of get a different sense of what's out there in the community. And you also hear what are their needs and what they and where you can be helpful to them. And I just think that's an important part of the church that when we say we're church is that to put it, you know, to actually be in a, to put yourself in a place 
and to make those places in the church community where you can really make people feel welcome, bring them in, hear what's happening out there, but more importantly, hear what their needs are so you can actually serve those needs. Um, and then there's practical things to your question. Like I think about the ministry I have now, I'm a strong believer in term limits. Our young adult ministry, it's two years. Listen, you're lucky if you have a young adult person for two years because they've got a life. They got to go do other things. But there are people who try, you know, there and and I'm with Yolanda. I kind of laughed a little when Yolanda said something. I don't know if it's a great no, it is a wonderful thing to say that you are a lector for 42 years. But can you also say at that point that you're that you made places for others to come in and lecture, right? I think of that's still a big issue, even at St. Monica, where, um, you know, I mean, if we really believe and wanted to be people part of community, the whole thing of letting, first of all, you can't have any reins. You got to look at all the posts, you look at the barriers you have put out there. And if in the end, what you really want to do is serve people, well, then you got to get them to you. So you got to think about the ways to do that. And so... I just, you know, I was lucky through both my family and um, and then through my, especially with the Newman, some of my earlier experiences in Catholic community that helped me, I guess, to be open in that way, to then want to desire that for other people. That's what I would say. So basically like having empathy of 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 others in their in their in their situations. Yeah, yeah, but but get to the point of understanding that empathy. Mm -hmm. Get to the point. I'm gonna say something just to tell you, and you have to also be aware that you got to be open to even some complaints, especially from the young generation, right? What they think because they have they get to say what they think about stuff. Recently there was a little stir. Audrey may have heard about it because some of the young couples coming in wanting to get married. We're making some comment about the cost of weddings here. Now, I don't know. Maybe they raised the price. I have to check on that myself, you know. But it's important to hear that. It's important to hear that because they all wanted to know my opinion. Honestly, I didn't know they had changed that. So I want to go look into that. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't have to tell anyone on here. Young people who are listening, you could be making what you think is a nice salary, but everything costs a lot more. Oh my God, especially on the greater West side or all of Los Angeles, for most of our young people, rent is half of your salary. So I'm just putting that out there that then here you are thinking you also want to get married at some point, or we want them to get married. I mean, all those things, th there's some reality pieces there. So it's, it's not just being, it's being having that empathy, but putting your plate, making sure to get yourself in a place so that you can be really empathic, that you really can try to understand what they need. Thank you. I, I'm You're really, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, thank you again to both you and Yolanda for, for answering my questions. Now I'm going to move it to my grandfather, Anderson Shaw. PJ, thank you so much for that. And Thank all the members of the panel. Uh, for those of you who are watching us on Facebook, if you have questions, please uh, please add them to the page, and we will pass it on to the to the panel to answer those those questions for you. But well, you guys did a great job. I really am just pleased that we were able to get this get this workshop together. Um, and for those of you who are who are watching this now, and you wanted. You didn't have a friend. You wanted the friend to be in. The friend didn't make it. It's on Facebook. It will be there. And uh, if it if we happen to lose the space for it, we'll move it to uh, YouTube. But it will be on Facebook for at least a year. So if you want someone to come, just come to our Facebook page where you are now, and you'll be able to you'll be able to direct them, and they can then experience what you just experienced. This is a wonderful workshop. I think this really is a as a as a um, a guide for those folks who who would like to have a, a young adult ministry, also as a checklist for those who have a young adult ministry already. Um, I I agree with the last comment that Dallas was making because we see that play out a lot. I did a listening session for arranged a listening session for Bishop Clark a number of years ago, 
as we will look at our young adults and, and, and what the bishop would do uh, to get them more involved in the church. And the group we picked was a cross-section of folks from all over. I think it was about 15, it was not 20. And what we got out of there, what I got out mostly was that the, to uh, many young people, you know, forgetting about the religious part of it, but just from, as Della said, from a life experience thing, uh, most of them wanted to be able to um, to get mentors, to find people who they could help them as they're starting out their careers, or either in the middle of their careers. Also, places about you know someone could to, to could help them to find a better place to live, you know, uh, um, a better job. I mean, those kinds of real life things are, are, are very important. You can't, you can't ignore that as you start to speak to them about church. And one of the things I remember years ago, Dallas, and I, I had you do something like this, um, Veronica, I forget now, was about the program at St. Monica, was uh, how you start in a group got so large that you had to break into two groups because it was too many for one meeting. And I heard there was people got married, there were folks, someone became a priest, someone became a nun. I mean, those are the kinds of things that can happen. You know, when you bring in a group of people like that, when you get people our age who are, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're just, we're not gonna move that fast and we don't change that quickly. Uh, but young folks can actually break a church alive. Young adults can make it alive. and I. I, I did a workshop um, as a part of liturgical training, and I enjoy doing it. It's on, on uh, welcoming, and most of the material that I use came from Dallas and some of the folks at St. Monica. So they have this wonderful, wonderful atmosphere of that that just just jumps out at you. Uh, I've got um, someone looking now to see if there are any questions. On, on Facebook and so far, I mean, you guys covered so much. I mean, I don't know what could be asked. There are a lot of comments uh, from folks thanking you for, for what you've done, um, uh, praising what you've done, and just in general, check, get checking off of a lot of the things. So I don't really see, though, um, anyone at this point, uh, Audrey hasn't seen anyone at all on Facebook. We scheduled 90 minutes and uh, we've gone 95 minutes now. <laughs> so it's not bad. We did pretty good. And I, I want to thank all of you. Uh, Yolanda, I, I, Candace, and DJ, I love that part you guys did up front. We sort of set the stage for what we're trying to do. I mean, you really talked about the issues and, and the study you did, Candace, is just absolutely. I mean, I would never have thought to do something like that, but uh, that shows how smart you are and how dumb I am or whatever. But that was very nice. Thank you so much for that. And uh, Yolanda, fantastic as always. You know, I, I just knew that was going to going to work well in Dallas um, with all the experience you got and and what I see at, at, uh, at St. Monica and Audrey uh, works there part time and from home and so I'm familiar with those folks out there and just so happy to have you all there. Um, I don't know, does anyone have any any final comments? I, I have some, I want to do a little bit of promotion for the center, but uh, I'll leave it open to any of you who may want to make a, a final statement that something that you felt that really needed to be said that hasn't been said already. Yes, Candice. Uh, well, I just want to say I learned a lot right now in Delis's and Yolanda's presentations. It's encouraging to me as someone who wants to uh, bring more young adults into my parish and, and children too, because uh, children are the future. Um, and so I really did appreciate that. And then also I was encouraged um, because I think there's a lot of different avenues uh, that we could explore to, to build up um, the greater uh, church community. And so I think there's a lot of cause again for celebration. And I just wanna put that perspective on because most of the time when, when people are looking at churches, 
it's like a, a lamentation almost like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? There's no young people or they don't care. They don't want to come back. But as DJ said, a lot of um, people um, of his peers are searching, right? And they're, they want that. So we just need to find a way to invite, inform. And um, like Della said, also just list, taking that feedback, you know, sometimes it's not going to be positive. So I'm just hoping that um, good things can com come forth from today and that we just remain encouraged. Thank you. Thank you, Candice. You're so, you're so right about that. I know that um, there are a lot of young people out there who would very much, as, as indicated in your survey, uh, would love to come back, but they don't feel welcome. And they don't feel it's there. I had an experience, I, I was, I told DJ I didn't think I would really get into this, but I was at one of our African American parishes a number of years ago, and uh, we were there to make a presentation. Uh, and in the midst of all of that, I congratulated them on on the music and and what that meant to the African American community historically. The preaching and the music kind of stands out when you look at our community. And um, I made the presentation. And I was walking out, and people were talking. This young lady came up to me. And she said to me, she said, I love this church and I wish I could come more often. And I said, why, why not? Why can't you come more often? And she said, and she pointed at a lady, she says, I don't come because every time I come, she just stares at me. She makes me, she makes me so angry and I don't want to be angry in church. And you'd have to see this young lady to see what might have been the problem with the older person. She was, she was pierced. She was pierced, you know, eyelids, uh, nose, earrings, all over. I mean, she had piercing all over, which could make some folks uncomfortable. But there's no reason not to welcome someone. But another young lady who worked with us and went off to college and came back. And the dress is one thing that comes up with all the time. But she had gained a little weight. And as she was going to communion, one of the ladies she had known most of her life grabbed about a hand and she says, darling, you're getting too fat. You know, that's the kind of stuff that really turn young people off. And and it's just, it hurts sometimes when you see that. And 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 uh, Candace, she was saying something about, you know, people learning and something from all of this. Nothing is gonna change until you yourself decide to welcome people in to believe that they can do it. DJ was, I don't know, he was maybe 10 years old, if he was that old, and he followed me around all the time. I had a meeting at the cathedral. We go in the cathedral with the pastor, the, the liturgical person, and we're about to start meeting. And someone said, can we get an opening prayer? I turned to DJ, and I said, DJ, would you give us an opening prayer? And he did, at 10. Now, I, I say that because you've got to ask them. You know, I'm, I was asking one of our parish reps, we have 25, 30 parishes we work with and meet monthly. Dallas is a part of that group. And I, I, I say to them that you've got to believe they can do it. You know, you've got to understand that it starts with you. We were talking about <clears throat> vocations. And so, well, they said, well, there's no young people in, in, in my churches. We go to school, you know, kids in the school. And and priests will tell you those who do vocations that I think it's either seventh or eighth grade boys really seriously think about the priesthood, and they don't know why that grade, but they do. And so I said to her, "Why don't you just give?" Well, I don't think those kids will want. I said, "You're making a judgment call, and you shouldn't do that." So part of the thing is that we have to really um, pass the reins. We need to pass the ball, but we're afraid of losing our seats. And that is something that really is disturbing. But I want to thank you all again. I mean, this has been wonderful. And I um, I, I still don't see, and Audrey hasn't said anything, so we still don't, don't have any questions. And I think that's a compliment to you. I mean, we covered, you covered everything. I mean, you know, from what is the problem to, you know, how's the pastor look at it? And then how do you take the program and make it successful? And so you've done all of that. I want to thank you for such a, such a wonderful presentation. But I would like to say this, that you know, the primary purpose of the African-American Catholic Center 
is to encourage active participation in all aspects of the church. And, and we believe that the Holy Spirit is making the laity conscious of our responsibility to serve Christ and the church in, in all circumstances. So it is right that we sit and we talk about young adult ministries. It is right that we sit and we talk about racism in the church. It is right and proper that we talk about liturgy and the way it's presented to us. As a Black Catholic apostolate, we seek to broaden and cover all aspects of the Black experience in the church. This summer speaking session is one way we attempt to bring attention to that responsibility. And for 17 years, we presented sessions that address the concerns of the community at large in the hope that we can show Christ and work at work in all circumstances because he's there. We can see him in each other. We can see him in others that strangers that we don't know if we're looking for him. Our June session, which is the one we just completed, was focused on young adults. Our July session will, will teach a little bit of the Bible. And the August session will focus on liturgy, all of this coming from a Black Catholic perspective. We will also in November, which is Black Catholic History Month, celebrate our annual ancestral mass at St. Odilia. St. Odilia was built in 1926 specifically for African American Catholics at a time when most churches are, most churches were really more uh, nationalist. They were Italian churches, they were um, Irish churches, German churches. And the bishop at that time realized and saw, in fact, that Blacks didn't fit in with some of those. In fact, some of those folks were absolutely just rude. And one pastor, I understand, said back at the time that they were trained to deal with people like us. So he decided, the bishop did, that he would build a church in Los Angeles specifically for African Americans. He, he picked, say, named the St. Odelia, and he called it the National Black Catholic Church. I shouldn't say Black Catholic. The word then was the National Negro Church, which was to fit in with the national, with those national iris and all the others. At that time, there was such a popular, uh, such an unpopular idea with some folks. But then the NAACP, I think maybe for, for the first time, gave a Catholic bishop an award for taking that broad step. Now, today, as we look back, to say that the church uh, called the, the National Black Catholic Church or whatever, folks may think that they're trying to exclude us. But then it was a matter of inclusion. And then in January, we hope to see everybody for our Martin Luther King celebrations, our prayer breakfast, worship, worship, workshops, and mass. And February, as everyone knows, is Black History Month. And we hope to see you there for that as well. With that, I, I want to again thank our panel. Um, and we look forward to continuing the journey uh, as we build this apostolate. And, and push for our own Black experience. Because we, as, as noted in history, have always been involved. In fact, we're working on a, a workshop for October, which is kind of out of sequence for us on the influence of Africa or Africa during the, during the, um, during the early church. And that is a fantastic piece of history. And uh, we're looking to, to do that. We got a couple of folks lined up for that and working on that. But again, thank you very much. Uh, hope you all have a have a great evening. And for those of you uh, who are on Facebook and Paris Reps, we moved this up so you can go to LMU for the graduation, and uh, which is at three o'clock, and I'll see you there. Bye-bye all, and take care, and we'll meet again.